Hello everybody, how's it going, and welcome back to the tier list stuff. We are going to do obscure consoles today. Um, I think I mentioned the last one, that that was one I really wanted to uh, make and do, so that is what we are going to do. Um, kudos to you if you can identify most of these by just the small little picture. Um, even I might have to look up a few of these when I go back through, uh, but I think I've got most of them down pat, so... Um, yeah, we're going to go through um, these today, talk a little bit about them, and kind of rank them um, as they are, if they were a decent console, or a crap console, or whatever. Um, that can be based on multiple factors, as we will discuss. Um, yeah, some of these, uh, basically when I say obscure, I mean basically not main line uh, release. So not Nintendo, not Sega, not PlayStation, not um, Microsoft and not Atari. So, um, before Nintendo and stuff, there was the Atari console, uh, the Atari 2600, which was the main console of that era. There were others that were semi-popular, as two of them are uh, sitting here with us. Um, three, actually. Uh, two of them more popular than the third, but hey, who am I to judge? But, yeah, we're gonna go through them, talk a little bit about them, and, uh, and kind of rank them. First on the uh, list is uh, this big mother here with the giant keypad on it, as well as two Atari-like controllers. It's a one-button joystick, uh, but I found that the Odyssey 2, which is what this console was, their joysticks weren't as stiff as the um, Atari was. I found the Atari a very, very stiff uh, joystick, whereas the Odyssey wasn't. Um, the Odyssey as well has, like I said, the giant keypad on it, as some games did require certain keypad commands and stuff outside of just your regular uh, joystick. You'll see that as possibly a repetitious thing. Um, but it did take consoles. It took actual consoles. Uh, consoles. Cartridges. It took cartridges. Um, I actually have uh, a few of them uh, lying around. They had an interesting handle to them um, to be able to help pull it out for no apparent reason at all. I've never had a struggle pulling out um, a, cart a game from a, a system, from a, a cartridge-based system, uh, with the exception of the Intech Interact, but that's a totally different story there. Uh, but yeah, for whatever reason, they have handles kind of on them, sort of like how the Atari Jaguar tried to do handles, which made no sense. Um, it just really sucks. So I prefer end labels over handles um, because they don't have end labels, just like N64 uh, and Atari Jaguar, funnily enough. Um, so yeah, it was a pretty innovative console for its time. It did come out, I do believe, pre-Atari. Um, so it was an innovator. And Odyssey Magnavox was the company that made them. Actually made the first video game console ever released uh, that was cartridge-based, which is the original Odyssey. And the Odyssey 2 was just an attempt to improve on that. And while there was no Odyssey 3 uh, or anything really above and beyond that until we get into the Philips Magnavox CDI, which we will get into later, um, it, was, uh, it was a pretty good console for its time. So I'm going to have to give it a solid A tier for uh, its efforts in trying to um, bring arcades into the home pre-Atari age. The next one is the Odyssey, same company, Magnavox, so it's the original Odyssey. Now this one's different because it does take cartridges, uh, however its controller is hardwired into the console as well as I believe its uh, video cable too, uh, as well, is hardwired into the console. And the uh, cartridges uh, are variations on like lines and blips on the screen. You had to actually have overlays that went over your CRT screen at the time. There was two sizes, I do believe, for different size CRTs. Um, and yeah, that's how you played video games, was literally with uh, this overlay on the screen, uh, and you just moved your blip around the screen as accordance to that. The games, when they came in boxes in this uh, era, very, very primitive era, uh, was more like getting a video version of a board game than it was actually a video game. It was very, very different. Uh, so, uh, very strange time, uh, but it was the first video game console, and it was an experiment, um, and honestly, I have to give praise to Magnavox for the Odyssey uh, series, both the two main consoles and all the Pong consoles, because they did something that could have totally backfired in their face uh, 100%, uh, and it kind of did later on. 
Um, I don't really know how much profit or money they really made off of Magnum of the Odyssey series of stuff, but obviously it was enough for them to continue to produce it for uh, a good couple of years. So I'm going to give the Magnavox Odyssey a S tier because it started it all. S for starting everything. So good job, Magnavox. Now this one is a bit more of an obscure one. A lot of people have heard of the Odyssey 2 and some then in proxy the Odyssey 1 because... People talk about the Odyssey that know about it generally like, oh, well, guess what the first video game console ever made was? Oh, that's snooty shit. This is the RCA Studio 2. What about the RCA Studio 1, you may ask? I don't know. This is an RCA Studio 2. It was a uh, released in the Pong console days. So before Nintendo and before Atari really snatched up uh, the main share of the market in video game home consoles, there was a period of time where companies, literally anybody, would produce these Pong consoles. And literally all they had on them was Pong, sometimes different variations of Pong, like handball, hockey, skeet, stuff like that. Uh, but generally, that's all it had on it. They didn't take any kind of cartridges. It just was plug and play. So there were tons of these. Magnavox produced um, Thousand Series, so the Magnavox Thousands. Uh, even Nintendo got in on the action uh, with the um, Famicom TV, I think it was called. Something like that, around that. Uh, it was only playable in Japan, but they still got in the craze. Uh, another famous one is the Sears Telepong, uh, which was sold at Sears stores. Uh, it, it literally looks like a charging dock for Wii remotes. <laughs> it's quite the uh, it's quite the weird shape, uh, but there was tons and tons and tons and tons of these uh, made by obscure companies uh, that you've never heard of and will never hear from again. Uh, all the way to big companies like Sears, like Magnavox, like Coleco, like Atari, even uh, and Nintendo. So it was quite the era. But the RCA Studio Two uh, was a Pong console, but it was also a home console. In the fact that it did take cartridges. Now these were very, 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 very primitive games. Um, stuff like, you know, Centipede, um, for example, or Snake. So we're getting into that really weird, obscure area. But yeah, it's a pretty fascinating console. Um, the controllers are literally on the sides. And I don't mean like, oh, you just detach them from the sides. No, they're attached to the console itself. So if you want to play a two-player game, which it looks like you can, um, you'd have to kind of huddle around the console. So a bit of a weird concept there. Nothing really super innovative. I mean, most people don't know the RCA Studio 2 even exists. Um, it didn't really do a whole lot for the gaming industry. I mean, at this point, there was stuff like the Odyssey um, and... Uh, at that point, you know, Atari was, if not out, in development and being ready to be pushed out. So, yeah, I'm going to go with the C tier for the RCA Studio. Um, you know, it's there, it exists, it's fine. Uh, I've never heard anybody, like, yell at it like the Virtual Boy or something like that, or the CDIs. So, but at the same time, it's not exactly memorable. So, you know, C tier. Uh, next, we move on to one of Atari's biggest competitors, which is the ColecoVision. Now, the ColecoVision is an interesting system. I recently actually had a whole bunch of ColecoVision stuff, although most of it, I think, if not all of it, is now sold. Um, except for maybe one or two games and the power adapter that came, the extra power adapter that came with it. Um, yeah, I think that's literally all that's left. Um, but yeah, I, I actually had one recently. It's an interesting console because it is quite um, good at compacting itself. The controllers actually fit into the console itself when they're not in use. Um, and it's nice and sleek and rectangular. There's no weird jutting outs or anything like that, which is really nice. Um, it takes regular cartridges, just like the Atari. Um, the controllers are interesting because it looks like a telephone. Uh, there is your joystick and button at the top and then there is a keypad with uh, numbered buttons on it now when you got the games new or in the box uh, they would come with overlays for that button system you would just slide it in underneath which was an interesting concept although it could get very confusing because different games had different stuff or some of them didn't have anything at all some of them had all some of them had not uh, like two it was very weird uh, for an era of gaming that was simplistic where the atari uh steamed ahead of everybody with literally just a controller that has a joystick and a button on it uh the complexness of the ColecoVision controller is uh both too early for its time and obsolete at all at the same time <laughs> Uh, the ColecoVision's joystick as well was quite stiff, but I mean, that's again just something of, of the era. The only one, again, that I think personally got joysticks completely right, although they break quite easily due to it, is the Odyssey 2. Um, however, 
The ColecoVision does have a few things on top of its competitors, uh, which includes its modules. So there are multiple different areas on the console that you can plug different stuff in, and there are two in particular that are worth talking about. The first one is the Atari module. So what actually you can do is plug this module in and play Atari 2600 games on your ColecoVision. So not only could you have a ColecoVision and play it, but you could, instead of buying an expensive Atari, you could buy this cheaper add-on to play Atari games. You could also plug in Atari controllers into the ColecoVision. They had the same um, type of pin. You could also plug in a Sega Genesis controller. I am not kidding. They're the same pin layout. So you could essentially say, fuck those stupid telephone controllers and play the games with a Genesis controller instead if you really wanted to. Uh, how well that works, I don't know. Uh, but generally, you could just play it with like the Atari joystick or just say, fuck it, and play it with the telephone controller. Most games didn't require much button pressing anyway. Uh, so that's kind of cool. And the second one is like this weird <laughs> trifecta of things. Actually, no, sorry, it's not the trifecta. It is the steering wheel and pedals. So it came, uh, there were racing games and stuff on this uh, console, and you could actually plug in a racing wheel and foot pedals and play the console with those. And it's kind of cool to be able to do that on a console so early on. Yeah, it's very primitive, uh, but it worked quite well for the racing games that were included uh, with it. The one I'm thinking of is the Coleco Telstar, <laughs> the Telstar Arcade, which I didn't include in this uh, because I did include the ColecoVision, uh, but the Telstar Arcade is an interesting one as well. Um, we'll talk about that sometime. But the ColecoVision actually, I think, because of the add-ons, uh, because of what it can do and what it tried to do to really get ahead in the market, deserves a bit of praise, so I'm going to put it with the Odyssey 2 in, as an A tier. Next, we have the Vectrex. If you've ever heard of vector graphics, this is the system that really made it popular. Vector graphics is line graphics. So the lines would go to certain vectors on the screen, and you would play using those lines, essentially. It does make for a very crystal clear image, and the Vectrex, when it's in perfect working condition, has some of the clearest, crispest pictures of the CRT age, with the exception of maybe on a Commodore monitor. Uh, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful system. And it literally is a, a TV in itself. This is a system that you don't need to plug into a TV because it comes with its own television. So the games slide into the side of the TV, the controller pops out of the front, you turn on the television, and the game starts playing on the TV, and you just pop and play as you want. There are some pretty great games and stuff for the Vectrex, and the Vectrex has become a major collector's item, unlike some of these weird, obscure consoles. A lot of people want to get a hold of a working Vectrex. They go for a ridiculous amount of money, but they're actually well worth it because they are a hell of a lot of fun. I've run across two in the entire time that I've been doing buying, selling, trading, any kind of collecting of games, and that's coming on, Jesus, coming on 10 years now. So I've been doing this for a very long time. Uh, not as long as some guys, but a fairly long time for how old I am and stuff and, and how late I got into the into the craze of everything. So the vet, I've only come across two of them. Um one of them was was mine. I purchased it and bought it from a guy uh, in Nova Scotia, and the other one was in a buddy's uh, game shop um, that he had, um, which was really cool. And yeah, it's a neat system. Um, it's very collectible. It didn't do a whole lot with the exception of the introduction of vector graphics, but overall it's a really cool uh, system. Huge and heavy and a home console for sure, but really cool. Um, it doesn't do anything super special, but because it's so cool, I'm going to put it in the middle in our first B-tier um, console. Neat Vectrex, man. Now we get into the Nokia N-Gage. So, this console came out at a time when stuff like uh, beepers and pagers were really huge, and this ac console actually had the ability to access the internet. Yes, you had to plug it in back in those days, there was no Wi-Fi, but it had the ability to do that, which means it was really more of like a digital planner than it was a game system. But it did have games, and it had some like, like top-tier title games, which is really, really, really weird, because you'd never think... Um, like, a console like this would ever have anything super, super good. But it had Rayman 3, uh, Tony Hawk's original Pro Skater, um, stuff like that. Um, 
yeah, Asphalt. It had the Asphalt games, which is kind of cool. It, it was weird. It, it was really, it was just weird. It was just very, very, very weird. But it had stuff like Bomberman for some reason. Uh, Call of Duty, the original, the original Civilization was on there. Crash Nitro Kart, Elder Scrolls Travels uh, was on there. Some FIFA games. Like we're talking, you know, like triple A titles were on this system. I'm pretty sure Doom was even originally on this system, um, which is insane. It's absolutely insane. Um, but yeah, if you're if you want something weird and you also want to play like actually decent games, the N Gage isn't a bad pickup. Although because of its age and because of the technology at the time, it does play super poor. It feels more like a Game Gear than it does a Game Boy. So the picture's usually not that great, sometimes pretty washed out. Uh, the screen itself is pretty notorious for failure uh, compared to stuff like the Game Boy. The sound on it is also quite hollow uh, in comparison to the Game Boy. So, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Weird early 2000, late 90s thing, but not super, like... Great, so I'm going to give it a C tier. Alright, now we're getting into some crazy, wacky, nutso, butso stuff. This is the Panasonic Laser Vision. I've never come across one of these things, but I've watched plenty of videos on it. Uh, it was a console that came and left very quickly. There was very few games on it. Um, in fact, I think there was a limited library of, like, what was it, like, 12? Um... Let me hold on. Panasonic Laser Vision games. <laughs> there weren't many. Um, there was the 3DO, which was pretty great too. Um, but yeah, the Panasonic Laser Vision didn't do super well. Um, gonna give that one a D tier. It just nobody remembers it. Uh, okay. Oh god. The Gamecom or Game.com. This was made by Tiger Electronics. Now. Tiger is famous for producing those cheap-ass handheld bullshit games that cost like $4.99. Um, I think McDonald's and Burger King also released some under their uh, Happy Meal toy stuff uh, through Tiger as well. These things are horrid. And what did they decide to do? Make a game console out of them. It was essentially graphics... Uh, in the way that drawing it on etching sketch is graphics. It was literally just kind of pre-drawn up uh, screens that get lit up when you do stuff. And my god, was it terrible. It was kind of like the N-Gage as well, where it did have the ability to do uh, certain, like, pagery type things, like an early communications device. I don't remember if it had the ability to connect to the internet, but it did have a planner uh, and a calculator and stuff in it. It was quite unwieldy, and the pen was quite large for the touchscreen, because yes, it was actually a touchscreen. Um, and it was just an awful design. Keep in mind, Ty this isn't even Tiger's worst console. I didn't put it on here, but there is a console called the R-Type that is just awful. Awful, awful, awful. It uh, the, the one that I have seen and played uh, wraps around your head. I'm pretty sure R-Type is what it was called. Um... Tiger consoles. Um, I think it was called the R type, but I don't remember. R zone. Sorry, R zone. Not R type. R type is the really good NES game. R, R, R type is great. R zone. Uh, it was like a. It, it fit over your head like a strap, um, and it came down over one eye, and just it was red graphics like the Virtual Boy, but it was the same kind of bullshit, and it was terrible. So D tier for that fella there. Now we get on to Panasonic's more successful venture, and that is the Panasonic 3DO. The Laser Vision essentially became the 3DO. That's why the Laser Vision really isn't remembered or, or really known. And there's probably going to be people that yell at me like, well, the Laser Vision actually is the 3DO. It actually isn't, but okay. Um, the 3DO uh, used real life graphics i know that sounds weird uh it's essentially like a, uh, a video game made in in real life instead of um drawn or or graphics up in an engine uh or designed right it's literally like real people 
and it was it was very bizarre and a lot of the games just didn't work super well um the sega cd also did stuff like this with games like night trap uh which is has been re-released i do believe which is just i don't even know what to think about that one uh it wasn't a great console it wasn't a super memorable console it was also a very weird console in the fact that um you had to plug in the second controller i do believe this was the console that you required to plug the second controller into the first controller um which just makes no goddamn sense um 3do came and went uh some people remember it most people don't see it here um now we're getting into what is this i don't even remember what this is oh the amiga this is the amiga Amiga was a computer company back in the 70s and 80s, and they did re uh, release um, an actual games console outside of their computers and com gaming computer uh, brand. The Amiga CD was released and did CD games. It was very similar to the like 3DO and the Philips CDI. Uh, there are some pretty decent games though on amiga and it is very expensive to get a hold of these a lot of people that do remember and are fans of amiga are hardcore fans there it's pretty hard pressed to find hardcore fans for like the 3do or the n-gage or anything like that uh even like the vectrex and odyssey not so much but the amigas there are some hardcore fan base guys out there for uh, the amigas so just for that testament alone i'm gonna give it the b tier now we come into the console that I know too much about, the Philips CDI. It uh, it came out with multiple different versions. This is the top loading version in the picture, because uh, it's the one that I could find that was the appropriate size for this tier thing. Um, but there were like kind of like the 3DO, how how it has the side like uh, open disc thing. Um, there's that as well. Um, there's two of them, I do believe. I think one is even produced by Gold Star. That might have been the 3DO, though. I don't remember. They mix together so much. They have similar styles. The Philips CDI is famous, though, because it is the only Nintendo uh, non-Nintendo console with licensed Nintendo games on it. So the Philips CDI, if you don't know, uh, was going to be the Philips CD add-on for the Super Nintendo. Now, that fell through. Um... <laughs> hardcore fell through in fact uh super uh, nintendo even got into talks with playstation before the original playstation was uh produced to make a cd version of the super nintendo um which i believe there was a prototype model that went on auction and sold for something like three or four hundred thousand dollars recently which is insane um but hey whatever um yeah and so it has one mario and i believe it's three zelda games so the mario is hotel mario it is awful uh and then there is zelda wand of gamelon zelda's adventure and something else link-esque i don't remember the name you know what, it might be a good thing uh these games come at outrageous prices because they are very rare the cdi itself is also quite expensive um over a hundred dollars i believe for the console itself um uh, they have a very high failure rate and they're just notorious for being awful just awful um it's not worth picking up if you want to play actual games if you're a collector that's one thing you want to play good games though no d tier for the cai now we come into the ColecoVision's uh number two competitor i guess because atari is number one but if atari wasn't there definitely number two because it's very similar the intellivision the Intellivision, instead of going for a gray, black, uh, plastic look, went for the classic uh, 70s, 80s wood grain style with the gold inlay. Uh, so it's gold in the top with black plastic in the middle um, and then a wooden base. The controllers, similar to the ColecoVision, sit inside of the console. And it's very uh, rectangular, very, you know, it's, it's quite good um, as far as shape-wise. Uh, same style of controller, although a little different, uh, with a stiff um, disc instead of a like joystick. So it's a little different in that aspect, um, where it's a disc and not really a joystick per se. It still has the phone style, so it still calls. <laughs> it doesn't call. Uh, there's still like the overlays and stuff from the Intellivision games. Overall, it was a console. Excuse me. That was remembered 
fairly well, but I don't think as well as the Coleco. Um, there wasn't a Television 2 model as well released, whereas I don't think the Coleco ever got that far. Um, but I remember the Coleco more fondly and more often than I do in Television, um, just because the Coleco did more, you know, crazy bold shit, like trying to literally copyright its competitor uh, and not somehow get sued for it. Uh, can you imagine if Xbox had an add-on that played PlayStation 4 games? That would be insane. There'd be lawsuits everywhere. Uh, it just wouldn't work. <laughs> so most people seem to remember the ColecoVision over the Intellivision just for that add-on alone. Um, the one thing that the Intellivision does have going forward, and it's only, as far as I'm aware, expansion module, uh, is the voice synthesis module, which literally uh, talks your games out. Um, there's a pretty famous line by the Angry Video Game Nerd with B-17 Bomber, um, where the, he plays the Intellivision and it talks out the B-17 Bomber, uh, homepage, uh, and it's hilarious and it sounds like ass, <laughs> uh, but it's quite funny. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna put a B tier. It was a decent console for its day and stuff. It competed pretty heavily with Coleco, but I'm remembering Coleco more than I'm remembering Intellivision, so sorry. Next up is another one that people will literally kill themselves over, uh, much like the uh, Amiga, the Neo Geo. Now, the Neo Geo had a CD add-on, or actually a full CD console, uh, but it was it's remembered because its cartridges are stupidly huge. And the reason for that is because it uses true arcade cartridges, so the graphics were more true to the arcade versions of the game than any other home console out there. Now, when I say these things are big, I'm talking like they are the size of, like, an Xbox 360. Like, they are huge, massive fucking things. They weighed, like, five or six pounds each. They're absolutely monstrous, like, huge. They're also ridiculously expensive as well. Uh, not a lot have survived uh, throughout the ages, and because there's such a diehard fan base, even, like, the sports titles are worth, like, 40 or 50 bucks each, uh, let alone, like, good games. So, um... Yeah, it's an amazing console, though, that uh, really uh, brought forward uh, the graphic style and stuff, really helped um, solidify arcade games in the home as well. Um, their uh, controllers are also massive, but they're joystick controllers, much like how an arcade would sit. So you kind of just sit it on your lap and play like you would be uh, playing an arcade. So it's pretty good. Uh, fighting games and stuff like that are very memorable on the Neo Geo because of the arcade style. Stuff like Street Fighter um, and whatnot is very, very memorable uh, on the Neo Geo. Uh, and the CD version as well uh, also had some amazing titles. And uh, it's sad that Neo Geo never really got super off the ground and took advantage of a struggling Sega to become the main competitor to Nintendo. Uh, but the Neo Geo definitely definitely earns its place in history and gaming and gets a S tier ranking because it is just so good. Now we're moving from so good to also really good and that is the TurboGrafx 16. A lot of people remember the TurboGrafx. It actually had a pretty big library for the time for like being a non-mainstream console. Um, it was technically, I believe, when it was released, the first 16-bit console ever released, but I'm not too sure on that one. Uh, the games came in these hue cards, almost like really large SD cards, um, and slipped into the console. Uh, the, which, and they, these uh, games came in jewel cases. So, kind of like the PlayStation 1, PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 1 or PC. Uh, came in those kind of jewels uh, case style. There is a lot of really good uh, games. Uh, some of them, one of uh, my favorite two is Newtopia One and Two. Um, they're awesome games, but there's also stuff on there that's like super expensive, like the Bonk um, games. There's quite a few Bonk games that are really overpriced on that system, uh, but uh, they're fun games, and the system is great. The controllers are responsive and good. Uh, they're NES shaped, but they have you know more buttons, obviously. And and overall, it's a great system. Uh, the only thing that really holds back this system is its hookups. So even the NES has the ability to use AV style, like the red, uh, white, and yellow um, cables, whereas the TurboGrafx does not. You have to use um, like a coaxial style kind of thing, which is kind of outdated for the time that it was released, uh, considering you know the Super Nintendo uses standard AV cables, and so would the uh, Sega Genesis. So a little bit outdated, and you have to mod it to be able to use um, uh, like regular 
um, audio video cables on it. So that's a little bit of a downside, but overall, the TurboGrafx-16 is amazing. It also has a diehard fan base, much like the Neo Geo um, does, so there's that. Uh, and I've played a lot of TurboGrafx. Uh, I owned a TurboGrafx for some time, and uh, it's a great console to own. So I'm going to put that one solid S tier as well. Uh, if you don't own a Turbo Graphics, a Neo Geo, or an Odyssey, and you have the chance to pick any of these three up, and you love because and you have a love of games, they are worth the pickup. Now our last one, but certainly least, <laughs> is the Action Max. Now, when the 2000s were coming up, the late 90s, there was there was a lot of things trying to overtake VHS as better quality. Uh, laser discs are one of them. They're pretty uh, ridiculous and uh, and huge. I feel like I'd break them. Um, there was also, uh, of course, DVD starting to come out at that time, and there was Betamax tapes. Now, Betamax tapes were VHS tapes, but they were better quality and they were um, a little bit smaller, I do believe. Um, and they had their own special player and everything, and they tried to take over the VHS market. They didn't. They failed miserably, as you'll probably know, because most people remember VHS changing into DVD, but they won't remember Laserdiscs, they won't remember Betamax, um, and other um, more obs even more obscure um, changeover stuff uh, into the modern day, you know, discs and stuff. <laughs> Uh, and somebody decided that it would be a great idea to make a video game console using Betamax tapes. There, there is born the Action Max. Pretty much, I think, if not all, the games have that real-life graphic style of the Sega CD and 3DO, uh, where it's like real-life uh, arcade-style games. Um, there's like shooting game. There's a haunted house-style game. There's only like four or five total games for the Action Max. Uh, and they're all awful. <laughs> they're horrible games. Absolutely horrid. Uh, it's an obscure console that nobody really knows about, and the mod more modern than, you know, like the older consoles that we've talked about, like the RCA Studio, that nobody remembers. Nobody remembers the Action Max, even though it's more modern. And that is why it is a D-tier console. Nobody remembers it. It's a pile of garbage. Betamax is uh, just a, a outdated uh, system at this point. Um, and even, I think the Action Maxes don't even really cost too much if you want to pick one up with, like, its full library. Uh, you can pretty much do that, I think, for under, like, $200, which most of the consoles we've talked about are in and around that range anyway for the more obscure, rare stuff. Um, so, yeah, even the Coleco goes for, like, you know, $70, $80 in, like, minty, minty condition. So, it's pretty bad. <laughs> But anyway, that's it. We've talked about all of these consoles here, uh, some briefly, some not. Um, what is your favorite non-mainline -main console if you've played any? So when I say that again, remember, no Nintendo, no Sega, no PlayStation, no Microsoft, no Atari. Um, Atari I would allow to a degree, but no 2600 uh, and no uh, 50, uh, was it 56, 52 and no 7800 so none of the three main atari consoles that are out and about that people know about uh stuff like the jaguar is fine the lynx is fine um stuff like that but nothing mainline uh what is your favorite obscure console anyway leave a comment down below let me know and thanks for watching peace